in a way, trauma is what has made us. We all have trauma. It's rather to get really aware of it, befriend it, and see uh, what what are the ways to evolve maybe in it, or what what are the new options that maybe this brings you or creates. Because trauma isn't necessarily a bad thing. It, uh, like stress, uh, stress isn't only bad. Stress is a very, very good, very crucial reaction uh, of our immune system, of our body. Without it, we wouldn't be living. So I think a bit same applies to trauma uh, and good trauma, it does also make us more resilient. Hi, I'm Naomi Murphy and this is the Locked Up Living podcast where we talk with a wide range of people about harsh aspects of institutional life. We also explore some of the ways to overcome them and to grow and develop. I'm David Jones. So join us every Wednesday morning Six o'clock UK time for a fresh podcast. So today's guests are Hardy Puder and Monica Jacobson. Hardy has degrees in economics and business communication. And for the last 16 years, he's been an entrepreneur and established nine companies in very diverse fields. He's led um, over 600 plus membered sales teams in Scandinavia and America and established the world's biggest outdoor medicinal mushroom plantation. Since 2016, Hardy has been actively following the fields of psychedelics and psychotherapy as an investor and practitioner. Monica is a health promotion specialist, health coach and certified nutritionist. She's degrees in psychology and health promotion and also studied nutritional science, health coaching, nutrigenetics, nutrigenomics, and she's worked side by side with several doctors and functional medicine specialists. In her private practice, coaching and counselling people, she developed a holistic, in-depth mind-body approach. Monica and Hardy are co-founders of Inlibrium, which they describe as the world's first one-of-a-kind holistic transformation centre. Inlibrium was born out of a desire to bring about radical change in a radically new way by supporting visionary leaders to actualise their potential and maximise their positive impact on the world. Monica and Hardy have created a transformational programme unlike anything in the world, catalyzed by psychedelic assisted therapy, in Librium's in-depth programme integrates cutting edge therapeutic methods in a long term approach that aims to give you a deeper understanding of your core being, purpose and life mission. The programme is evidence based, data driven and most importantly, completely personalised. And I came across Hardy on LinkedIn where he'd posted, you posted um, Hardy a really excellent blog post after watching the Michael Pollan um, Netflix series How to Change Your Mind where you were taking issue with the idea that you can take drugs and have this amazing transformation without thinking about the much wider context that people might have for healing so really glad to have you both on to get a chance to talk with you today about what you're doing welcome thank you for having it's nice us to be here hello very nice to meet the two of you um, and thanks for coming along so can we begin perhaps by you telling us a bit about yourselves and how you've got to this point in your career? Um, perhaps you first of all, Hardy, because obviously your initial interest was in economics and now you're uh, more interested in or more involved in issues around mental health. Yeah, after, uh, after high school, when I went to study e economics uh, at university, I was first of all very fascinated uh, about uh, how things really work in this real world and I pretty soon became entrepreneur so I established my first company when I was only 19 years old but I didn't have that time any connection to mental health for this uh, area but uh, I was very good in establishing different companies but uh, all the time when I created something, I become successful in a couple of years. But inside was this kind of feeling that, hey, I'm missing something. Something is wrong in this, what I'm doing. And on that time, I thought that this business that I was doing that time, this is wrong. So we established a new company and a new company and a new company. And the same pattern continued almost a decade in my life. And for the age of 30, my physical and mental body started to collapse. So something was very wrong. 
like outside everything was beautiful i was successful i was very active i was doing sports and everything and i was not eating crap or something like this like i was eating more like a normal person more healthy but something was very wrong and uh, my physical and uh, mental body started to collapse and on that time it was in 2016 uh, I was so troubled that I was looking for help. Like I felt that, okay, this kind of thing can't continue like this anymore because otherwise it will not have a happy end. And I found one mentor and uh, he was starting to mentoring me. And he said to me that hardly your problem is that you're living in your head, not in your heart. Like you don't have, you have blocked all your feelings and like, and everything. You don't have any feelings. Like you are only calculating everything and you are not this, this physical crash that you're going through at the moment is caused by mental crash. And he, he started to talk about uh, different therapy methods, psychotherapy, trauma therapy, and so on. And also psychedelic assistive therapy and talked about psychedelics to me. For me, that time, psychedelics equaled with narcotics, so they are very bad, and I didn't know a thing about them. But as I had so huge trust on that person, uh, I was ready to try it out, because I was, uh, I was in the corner. I couldn't do any, I couldn't function in real life anymore. So I was willing to do whatever it takes to get out from this situation where, where I was. And um, I was introduced to psychedelics and this is how my mental health journey started. Uh, my first experience was in 2016 with this kind of substance called ayahuasca. And that changed my life. That it was, yeah, it was in a shamanic setting but uh, when after this retreat, uh, when I went back home, like this flow that was carrying me on that moment, then guys, I thought that I have discovered a magic pill. This is the uh, solution for all my problems. And life will be now beautiful without any physical or mental troubles. But it wasn't like this. So it was only for a couple of weeks and I fall back to the same or even the worse situation than before. But then I thought that, okay, those uh, psychedelics somehow helped me. Maybe I should try again. And I signed up again and went again. And then the flow carried me like one month, not one month, but one week or something. And I became like a serial tripper it is, I think this is this kind of saying in this field. Psychonaut. Psychonaut, yeah. Because I had an understanding that the so solution will come out of psychedelics. But it didn't. Like, uh, I thought the psychedelics will keep me answers for my problems. And they didn't. But I was like continuing and continuing this. And it lasted like a couple of years. And... Luckily, in 2019, I met first time professional therapist. And uh, this therapist uh, brought in this kind of word like integration. And I, I had never like uh, uh, done any kind of integration, like all those guides who were guiding those psychedelic assisted therapists were saying that uh, just be there, be in the frequency of love and everything will solve for you and life is beautiful. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't work like this. And um, then the word or the practice of integration came to my life and, uh, and we got together with Monica and uh, as Monica is specialized uh, to health promotion and psychology, and we started to talk and talk and talk and analyze like uh, what have happened in my life. And what came out was the change in my life happened only then when I um, had integration after these psychedelic assisted therapies. And then 
then we like understood that uh, the key is not in psychedelics. The key is in, is in uh, integration. Psychedelics can give you only the awareness of this dysfunctional pattern that you have in your subconscious mind that might keep you back from your full potential. But it's not the solution. It's never the solution. You get the awareness and the change will come in a normal states of consciousness and through integration. And under integration, I'm not talking about practicing uh, something like a week or two weeks. It takes months. It, it's, uh, the duration of, of integration is very long. But it's, it, it works like this. There isn't this kind of magic pill or, or yeah, like, uh, like you said, Naomi, that uh, in this uh, How to Change Your Mind, famous Netflix, like they're presenting it like it is some kind of magic pill. There are a lot of truth in this, uh, what they're saying, but uh, they're like uh, leaving out a lot of truth as well. So this is my story. This is how I was introduced to mental health and uh, and these kind of things in my life. But basically, background economics and now working with people. Thank you. That that's fascinating. And I know we're going to talk about psychedelics later on. But what you're what you're saying to me also is that you're talking about the creative process, particularly when you're saying how you made one company, then another, and another, and another. It's the creative process, which is followed by many, many great writers and painters. Cezanne, of course, is the most obvious example, somebody who spent years painting the same mountain, Mont Saint-Victoire in uh, Provence. And it's, as you say, it's that process of chewing things over, integration. It can take a lifetime. Mm -hmm. anyway thanks for that how about you monica yeah so <clears throat> our stories are uh, with hardy are somewhat similar um we were both collapsing both mentally and physically uh and for me the struggle was that i was studying this field i was in this field i was doing everything correctly and i was very young when i just noticed that my body is falling apart. I was 24 when I got a pre-cancer diagnosis. That really shook me. It shook my whole world. Uh, it really made me look for answers, uh, look for help. Um, and this is, I think, where my journey began. Um, my journey on self-discovery, um, seeing beyond <laughs> maybe the limits or what's written in books. Um, my journey back to myself. And uh, so today, in hindsight, I can really say that uh, what had happened for me was that I had completely lost touch with who I was, really. I was um, trying to be what I perceived that is expected of me. Uh, I was, um, of course, we're all conditioned in our own way, but I was really, you know, how we're taught, be perfect, don't make mistakes um get a degree get a good job and then do it for the next 40 years it doesn't matter whether you're happy or not but it's just good you know it's the social convention and this wasn't me uh i i was in the right field but as as also hardy's mentor told him that i was also so in my head and i was ignoring what my heart told me to do and i had really really lost connection with this um innate authentic part of myself and and sort of just blocked it uh, everything had to be rational everything um, that I did had to be somehow um, accepted socially or high standards so uh, my journey led to my first sort of a mentor and um, he also uh, recommended psychedelics to me and it was a um, scary road for me, but I was really also, I was in the corner. I did not know what else to do. I, I tried everything and, and things did not seem to get better. So I said, yes. And um, 
The other thing that Hardy and I have in common is that we both have experienced how psychedelics should not be done. So this was also my first experience. It was a complete, a total disaster. I, I'm very, uh, I weigh about 50 kilos, so I'm quite small. I'm super sensitive to everything. I was given a heroic dose. Basically, the whole experience for me was um, awful. <laughs> Um, not much to take away from it because uh, I, I lost all sense of reality and this is not what you expect when you go into this place. I wasn't prepared correctly uh, after that. I was just left hanging with all the question marks and in, in total it, it rather did more damage than good. Um, but it was a good lesson of what not to do. Um, so after that, for years, I turned my back on all these substances. I, I didn't feel comfortable or, or good around them. I also didn't know better or, or did, had no professional knowledge about these uh, things back then. And years after, uh, I was introduced to psychedelics again, uh, but in a form of microdosing, which for me was definitely a better format. And uh, I, I had the session with a therapist and and that experience for me was was truly life-changing also uh by that time i had already uh, managed to start helping myself uh really to start living in a more authentic way and um, so this was for me a piece uh in in the complete puzzle and it did help me um so uh, overall, I'd say that um, in, in my journey, uh, psychedelics have definitely been a part of the puzzle. Uh, but, but again, it's, it's just a small piece in, in the whole uh, puzzle because the change comes from the more holistic side, the combination of different things. And what I really encourage or, or want to get out there is the professional uh aspect of, of psychedelics um there are a lot of pseudo uh therapists i call them also out there so uh, there are ways to do these things there are ways that i do not recommend anybody um, also from my own experience um, but though those can be helpful and coming to the topic of uh how to change your mind then again um there's a lot more to tell or discuss uh, about it. So I, I do agree with Hardy that uh, there are no magic pills and every change takes dedication, it takes time, it takes commitment and it does take the holistic approach. And there isn't this kind of thing like, uh, uh, how to say it in English, uh, one fits for all. Yeah. Like we are all unique, so we all have our unique background, and the method, like that works on us, have to be unique as well as we are. This is what what I like. Uh, how you Naomi have told told me how you are working with your customers, like one to one, and my change started to come when I got like these one to one sessions, not these infamous group sessions around the world, everybody knows about them. Yeah, they are beautiful, but we are all so unique and everyone have their own traumas and dysfunctional patterns. It also needs unique therapy methods. Thank you. You're, you're both very, both very open. Uh, what were you gonna say, Naomi? Well, it's just, just that it's very, you know, it's interesting to hear both your stories. And I, I think, you know, much as I enjoyed that series, I think I, I know because I heard people talking about wanting to take psychedelics in the hope that like a magic wand, everything would be OK for them afterwards. And I, it was interesting to hear you, Monica, talking about about being petite and sensitive, because I think people take um psychotropic medication all the time and there's not much thought necessarily given into people's size or people's sensitivity and we know that people who are emotionally sensitive also react with more sensitivity to other substances don't we so um you know it's, it's interesting to hear how much thought and consideration is going into that part of the program but also the emphasis on that is just a piece of a, a, 
of a picture and actually there needs to be much more thinking about the wider context so thank you okay so within our podcast we've often come up against the theme of trauma but usually within you know the sphere of uh, people who have been uh, traumatized as impoverished young people and that kind of group with the exception of uh, some people in our private boarding schools, which is another story altogether. But you've blogged quite often uh, about people who are much more financially, academically or occupationally successful. Where, where does that come from? Mm, first of all, um, we think the trauma is universal. Uh, it does not ask your uh, position in society, like who you are. But uh, why it is uh, in in the la latest times, it, it is talked also a lot about trauma in very successful among the very successful people, and I think it has been talked about trauma like all the time like this, but because of the social media that it is it's helping to spread around the world it, it helps to helps us to know that uh, also like everyone are having their own traumas but there is like a, a question that i have been asking for myself like are these kind of leader type or su successful people are willing to like uh, say that they have different issues and different traumas because society is looking at them like a, like a, mm, how to say it, like a social uh, role models, yeah, yeah, examples. And uh, society waits from them that they are perfect and uh, they don't uh, blame about their, their lives and they will handle it. And uh, they are like role models. And role models can't have their shadow sides. I think this is one reason why it is not so much talked about uh, about trauma among uh, successful and highly educated uh, people. This is why we we decided that uh, as we have our own experiences with these kind of people and uh, they have like opened up themselves for us and talked about it. And when we, when we when established we our company in Librium. Then we also thought that uh, according to our experiences, when we had our own transformation, we thought that if this kind of successful people can have this kind of transformation, they can dissolve their dysfunctional patterns that might keep them back. They can face their traumas from the childhood, uh, like start to accept these kind of things, don't hide themselves anymore. Then like maybe this maybe can this really can. change the world and this is why we focused on this group of people it like we are working with people we are not working with successful or rich or highly educated people we are working with everyone who wants this kind of uh, uh, approach that we have created uh, yes and just to add, add. Uh, first of all i i just want to uh, say that we are not professionals in mm. this field. Uh, but trauma is is such a broad concept. There are so many different uh, definitions, concepts, um, and, and I'm glad to see that this topic actually it is talked about more and more. It's uh, it's getting out there. Uh, people are discussing, talking about it. I've even uh, come across the word trauma revolution. Uh, according to Vox, trauma was um, basically has been named as the word of the uh, decade. So this really has surfaced uh, with all what's going on in the world uh, the past three years or so. And of course, there are different classifications for trauma. Um, put really sim simply, the big T tra trauma, the small T trauma. So we only address the small T traumas. Um, we don't have the uh, capacity to work with uh, the real big influence traumas, the real life changing things that people um, have come across. So, um, 
And uh, in regards to the more successful people, then uh, uh, one aspect is that I also agree with Hardy that before social media, there also wasn't a platform for this topic to be discussed about. So I, I do think that this uh, topic was discussed maybe amongst the people, but uh, they did it in their own socioeconomic group, in their own, in the circle of their closest people. So this information just maybe didn't get out there. Uh, and, and with trauma, it's very common that people feel alone with their things. This is also something that uh, people have told us, those people who we perceive as, as really successful, people who have it all, who shouldn't have worries or, or negative thoughts or, or shame or guilt in their life, but they do. And usually people feel very alone with these feelings. So um, in this way, I think social media has helped a lot for, to, to take the can off mm -hmm. this topic and to get it out there. And also those very high, uh, high achieving people, uh, successful people, popular known people, they have started to talk about it. And I think this is very, very uh, good. And, and the, this also lays the foundation for the possibility for change and to people understand that this is a normal thing we all have trauma and my personal belief is that at least for the small t traumas uh trauma is not something you should get rid of or erase from your life mm. um in a way trauma is what has made us we all have trauma it's rather to get really aware of it befriend it and see uh what what are the ways to evolve maybe in it or what what are the new options that maybe this brings you or creates because trauma isn't necessarily a bad thing it, uh, like stress uh, stress isn't only bad stress is a very very good very crucial reaction uh, of our immune system of our body without it we wouldn't be living so I think a bit same applies to trauma uh, and good trauma. It does also make us more resilient. There are very many specialists who talk about it. Uh, Alexander Biner wrote a really, really interesting essay on the topic um, also of trauma. So it's not all bad. And, and my personal take on it is that um, Maybe we shouldn't want to get rid of it. And, um, but I also do believe that there still is a fair amount of maybe stigma or shame mm. around trauma, because I, I, I do think that at least in the older generations, it, it is associated with being weak or, or if, if you admit that you have something happened to you or, or something bad in your life, then you're weak. You should just sort of, ignore it and say it hasn't happened or or be beyond it so which i i don't think is a good thing to do also in in the context of mental so do you think there's a lack of sympathy for people in this kind of successful world who are suffering less sympathy for them than there might be for other people Personally, uh, I don't, and I'm 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 very I'm always very heartwarmed to see if if a quote unquote a successful people um, tell talks openly about their trauma or or these things that have happened, and I I rather see that this uh, information is perceived very positively in the society. Because for the other people, it gives the message that they too have it. They're, they're also people, they're all human. And mm -hmm. this is, in a way, it's part of the human experience. As I said, we all have encountered trauma. Uh, it's inevitable. It's, it's a part of life. So people may be, uh, those people talking about it, who we perceive as maybe superhuman or very special, extra successful, people who have it all. Um, when they open up about it, when they talk about it, I think this can be a very, very helpful tool for the rest of the society to also um, maybe acknowledge these things or, or look into these things because a lot of the trauma is just uh, the part that people are not aware of. 
maybe even. And, and maybe this encourages them to also look inside them and deal with these things. And as I said, um, befriend them mm. <laughs> and accept them and then just learn how to cope. And um... I, I, as you're talking, I can't help but think of our um, Prince uh, Harry Windsor, who was terribly traumatized by the death of his mother on the world screen when he was really just a young child. Uh, and of course, uh, he stirs up incredibly ambivalent and sometimes quite violent uh, feelings among yeah, the population. I was yeah. sorry, I was saying as you were talking, I couldn't help but think of uh, Harry Windsor, our, our prince, who was traumatized through the death of his mother in the car crash in uh, Paris. Um, and of course, it was screened across the uh, world and has been ever present since. Mm -hmm. So a really damaging experience, but it creates extremely ambivalent uh, feelings among uh, the population. And do you think that's fairly typical? Uh, for the population to have those fairly... Um, ambivalent, yes. Things? Uh, definitely. And I think this experience that we're talking about is, is the life-changing, the big T trauma. Um, not those small things that we we all encounter during a life, lifestyle lifetime. Um, so I also think that this uh, needs professional help uh, for the people who have experienced these things. Thank you, Naomi. I think um, I think David, you were highlighting how divisive. Um, Prince Harry's story has been so on social media has attracted a lot of hatred and anger at I suppose daring to speak out um, and with an element of the population preferring probably to see him as somebody who has privilege and so should just suck it up um, mm. rather than uh, there are obviously there is the other side to that picture of people really appreciating someone who's so visible speaking up about their experience and and seeing that he has you know he's a role model um for talking about trauma but it, it, it is quite distasteful to see the amount of um vitriol that he's he's attracted mm. and uh, in a way it's, it's really sad um uh, i'm not very up to date with uh, this uh, topic uh, precisely uh, but I'm really, really sad to hear that. And, and I do think that, um, of course, uh, this is where the negative aspect of social media comes in. It's, it's very easy to um, just state your opinion somewhere very anonymously. And uh, this might engage more and more people uh, talking about something that they have no idea about. And this type of... Um, this example that you brought, I, I think this shouldn't be commented on social media. It, um... This is because of the attitude uh, that I think all the nations have, at least here in Estonia and uh, I think in UK as well, that boys don't cry. Mm. Especially these kind of boys are not allowed to cry. Like, uh, mm. grow up, you are, you are important, you are famous. Like, it is not allowed for you. Like, what kind of trauma? Yeah, your mother got killed, uh, so you you need to take care of your country. Mm -hmm. But people don't see this kind of people anymore as people. Like, they are some kind of role models that uh, have their own things to do, what they have to do, have to do. And uh, everyone are looking at them for every second in their life and they don't have any any privacy and through those years like being in this kind of situation they are creating this kind of uh, armor around them but this armor will break in one moment like this or mental, they will break or they will break and then they can say something what they don't think uh, uh, 
they can act like they don't want to act anymore. The trauma gets out, this pressure gets out, and it's normal. But people are blaming them that they are not allowed to do like this. And I don't think it's it's the right thing to do. So every everyone have their own cases, and who who am who are we to like discuss like what is wrong for him or what what is right for him? Thank you. One of the consequences of traumatic events that is so hard to deal with is that sense of disconnect and isolation. And we've seen that repeatedly in people who come to contact with statutory services, so the more marginalised groups. But can being a leader amplify this loneliness, do you think? Yes. Um, we have, uh, like, we have a couple of customers who have told us that they're so lonely, uh, they are leaders of their groups, and they have no one to talk about it. And uh, as they are like uh, leaders, then they take it so, so seriously, and they amplified this feeling, this pressure inside of them. But a uh, lot, of, lot of these people are acting like they're acting because of some childhood trauma. And um, there have been cases where, where our customers have uh, told us that uh, they, are, they get this awareness that they, they are doing this, what they are doing because of uh, uh, some kind of mother trauma or father trauma from their childhood, that they uh, have this kind of pattern that they have to be successful. They, they need to prove it to, to their mother or to their father. And this is why they are acting like this. And as they are leaders, then this being this in this important position in society, it all amplifies it. And they are so lonely. Like once one gentleman said to us, very highly educated uh, person said to us like this, that Hardy, I'm so lonely. I have no one to talk about what is going on in my life. Because everyone are looking at me, they are waiting decisions from my side and answers. But I'm troubled. I'm in the corner. I don't know. I'm also weak, but I'm ashamed to show to others, to my employees, that I might be weak as well. And this hiding it, I think this hiding part is amplifying the most. Like they're not trying to show it to... Uh, to their close ones, to their uh, co-workers, and so on. But it all, it grows inside of them. It grows, it grows, and it grows. And this is only a matter of time when it explodes. And I guess as a, as a leader, there's, there's a pressure to protect the, the staff that work for you. You know, you don't want to expose them to things that are going to cause them worry. So I, I guess as a leader, you know, there is the the potential of if you speak with too much candor that people might start worrying about whether whether the organization is at, is at risk because you're not coping exactly yes so, also, uh, yes so, just to add uh, this is actually also why uh, in inibrium uh, in addition to working people with people individually we are also establishing a community for those leaders um, because what we've heard from them, again, as Hardy mentioned, is that they feel alone. They have nobody to share their ideas with. They have nobody to share the hard times with. Um, but all of them, in a way, understand uh, what, what it's about. Uh, they're the people who all experience it. So, um, Nobody should be alone with these things. And this is also uh, what we're trying to do to get these people connected so that they, they would also have a safe uh, place, uh, the empowerment, the support to do what they're doing and to not be alone in, in their troubles, which most people just don't understand mm. because this is how they're shown strong, uh, always making decisions as if there's not human, but they are. So, and also the social connectedness. If we're talking about mental health, it's a very, very important pillar. So 
for those people also to be able to be connected, be understood, and have this supporting community behind their back. And what are the other aspects of in Librium that that you that you offer? So, you know, what are, what what is it that you're that's woven together in your package? That what are the kinds of things that you draw on for the individuals that come to you? Mm -hmm. Great question. Thank you for that. So um, we have, based on our own experience, uh, we have put together a very holistic program. Um, we don't see the change only comes from one changing one aspect in your life. Uh, change comes from the holistic approach. So uh, first of all, uh, we focus uh, on this person individually. Our programs are all, all long-term, so it's minimum seven month long and focused on this individual, their baggage, where they are in life. Um, so all, all different life areas, what are they struggling with? Um, what's their background? Uh, what are their goals? So basically, uh, to put it really simply, it's uh, divided into three phase, phases. The first phase is the preparation phase. Um, getting the uh, person acquainted to the team. Different specialists already start working with uh, this person, preparing them, uh, coaching, guiding, getting them ready for their uh, therapies. Um, also uh, biometrics, all different health assessments, uh, emotional, uh, physical, uh, social. So to really understand, uh, to map out that person. Then there is uh, the therapy phase. So that's when the person is in their private therapy, whether psychedelic assisted or not. Uh, this really doesn't matter so much. As, as we said, then psychedelics are just a small part of the whole puzzle. Mm -hmm. And third phase is the integration phase. And um, when you look at our program, then actually 90, uh, to 95 per percent is strongly focused on the preparation and the integration. So this is the most important part uh, that we focus on. I think the I thought it was really interesting to hear about the fact that you have this aftercare where people are encouraged to stay in community because actually we can see that from people who do residential treatments uh, here in the UK that actually the being part of something as part of a community a therapeutic community it almost takes on a life of its own and people feel connected and as if they want to stay in relation to one another afterwards so you can see that that could be really helpful for people who are in a position where they feel feel quite lonely but finally it sounds like your journey has led you to both of you to understand the importance of working for good mental health rather than just taking it for granted what are some of the ways that you make sure that you achieve this and keep your mental health um, at its best? Um, once again, a great question. Um, so as with trauma, I think health is also a very broad construct. Uh, it's a multidimensional construct. Mental health is a part, a layer of this whole so um, as I already mentioned, then I think it's more than just doing one thing. It's, it's the big picture, it's the whole. So um, uh, definitely other aspects of health uh, are also crucial. Uh, taking care of your body, your physical health, uh, getting enough sleep, exercising, mm -hmm. all the health pillars, good nutrition, uh, gut health gut health and brain health, mental health are immensely connected. So to really take care of yourself in a whole body. Uh, On a physical and mental level. Yes, mm -hmm. whole body perspective, basically. So I think that is already a very good uh, start. And also um, when considering the good old Maslow's uh, pyramids then also mm -hmm. the top layer um doing the things you love finding your purpose in life your life mission not just living uh, according to social um convention or, mm -hmm. or what other people expect from you or or not 
living your life uh, and not being afraid to live your life because of what maybe others might think about you. So to really um, understand uh, what's your life purpose and and to have the courage to go and do that. So self-actualization is, is also, I think, a very big uh, part of the puzzle. Thank you, Monica. Ed Hardy, is there anything, yeah, anything unique to you that you would add? Uh, I I would like to add this kind of maybe it's it sounds like a cliche but uh, for me this truth it is stop lying to yourself. I I don't know how many calls I have had around the world with different people, and uh, at the beginning of call, they are all saying that their life is very good. They are very successful. Everything is very good. Um, what kind of what what is trauma it's it's interesting to notice that people don't know what is trauma at all or and, they don't want to acknowledge it yeah friends. but when i start to talk to them about my own journey about my own traumas how i lost my brother when i was five and a half years old and what it all created what kind of dysfunction and patterns they are very quiet behind the screen listening to me uh, 10 minutes ago, they said that they don't have any traumas and their life is beautiful. And when I'm ending with my story, sharing my story, like honestly, then they are still very quiet and, and slowly and slowly started to share like what is really going on in their life. And what comes out is that everyone had their own traumas. But they, but a lot of people have been thinking that it is not okay to share something so intimate from your life. Like, uh, why should I care that uh, you are traumatized or or this kind of thing? And they are hiding it. But mm -hmm. it have to start from somewhere. And in our case, like. Uh, I have been the person who is opening the door and, and sharing my own traumas that was keeping me back from my full potential in my life. And then they see that, okay, it's okay. I have similar things. I really resonate with it. Maybe I try to share it as well. And this is the beginning of the journey. This is how it all starts. Be honest to yourself. Don't lie to yourself. It's much more easier to live in this life it's easy to say, it's hard to do, but if, if you do it, if you stop lying to yourself, first of all, then your life gets to another level. Thank you. Really great advice for, for people. Well, we've come to at the end of, of the conversation. Thank you so much, both of you, for, for coming along today to, to have this conversation. Look forward to, to posting it. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, David. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, David. Thank you for having us. Thanks very much indeed for coming along. It's been a great conversation. Good to meet you.